most of us have had the displeasure of using banks. We all put our money in and pray that the bank will simply just leave it there. And just maybe if we get lucky, we can get some interest on our savings too. But that's really about it. But many of us have also experienced the terrible parts of banks, like those pesky overdraft fees that insist that since you have no money, you somehow need to find a way to pay the bank extra money. Like how in the world does that make any sense? But overall, we expect our banks to be relatively reliable, trustworthy, and fair. Unfortunately, Wells Fargo never seemed to get that memo. And if you were a Wells Fargo customer for roughly 14 years in the 2000s, you may have been unlucky enough to discover that firsthand. It could be any random day. You could be doing your laundry, watching TV, you know, just living your life. When suddenly an employee from Wells Fargo calls your phone and tells you that the worst thing possible has happened. Someone has stolen your account. The fraud is so extreme that they recommend you close it and open a new one. And reluctantly, you may agree. I mean, if someone at a bank is telling you that your money might be stolen and you should create a new account, you just kind of do it, right? But while they're signing you up for that, they sneak in some other things too. And just like that, you're signed up for online banking. Oh, and now you also have a credit card. What about that extra random account? Yep, you got one of those as well. The only problem is you agreed to none of this and are completely unaware. And now there are about 15 different services in your name that you have no way to monitor and just can't cancel either. Kiss some of your hard earned money goodbye after paying for accounts that you don't need and have no use for. Meanwhile, in Wells Fargo's world, they were making bank and rolling around in joyous excitement that they had cracked the code on how to get more accounts than it was physically possible for them to have. While the executives celebrated, the employees who had been pressured to become involved in this massive scam were comparing their time with the company to literal war. So what the hell was going on at Wells Fargo? Why were they creating fake accounts? Why was this job so stressful that their employees compared it to war? And what else has been going on with them throughout the years? Hello, and welcome to the Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about Wells Fargo Bank and the decades of scandals they've been involved in. Have you ever had a super high pressure job, one with like unrealistic goals that are set for you, a shitty boss that can't accept no for an answer? Well, between the years of 2002 to 2006, Wells Fargo was the definition of a shitty job for its employees. One day, the bank's executives decided to make cross-selling products their main goal. Basically, if someone had a checking account, they should have a credit card too. And if they have a credit card, they should have insurance. The goal was to create as many accounts as physically possible in the shortest amount of time. The only problem was that their quotas were literally impossible to meet. One banker had about 11,000 prospective customers in her area. Meanwhile, she was instructed to somehow meet a quota of over 12,000 new accounts. Something about that certainly seems just a bit off, but not meeting the quota was evidently not an option for their employees either, because if they failed to meet the physically impossible sales goals, they would be punished in a variety of ways. Some claimed that they would be transferred to a store where someone had been shot and killed or forced to walk out in the hot sun around the block. And listen, Wells Fargo, you're a bank. It's not that serious. There was absolutely no reason to treat employees like that. But they continued on with their horrendous and immoral practices to pressure their workers. And boy, were they feeling that pressure. Angie paid and worked for the bank from 2011 to 2014. During her three years at the bank, she was having random panic attacks that were so severe that she believed she was actually having heart attacks. At some point, she had a panic attack that was so terrible that she went to the bathroom and took a drink of some hand sanitizer. She immediately felt her anxiety subdue and soon this was becoming a daily practice. Every morning she would go to work and drink hand sanitizer. Eventually she was drinking a bottle a day. Can you imagine the type of stress you have to be facing to just start, you know, guzzling hand sanitizer? Another employee said he had less stress in the 1991 Gulf War than working for Wells Fargo. All of this happened because they wanted to meet unrealistic sales goals to boost their numbers and make it seem like they were the best bank in the world with more customers than physically possible. So what exactly happens when you mix extreme pressure with overworked employees and threats of punishment? Well, you get people lying, cheating, and scamming to reach their sales goals. And so the Wells Fargo account scandal was born. Desperate to meet those sales goals, people began signing customers up for anything they could without their permission. If you signed up for a checking account, congratulations, you also now had two unnecessary debit cards so the banker could make it seem like they were making more sales. Some of them would use their own contact information on the forms when setting up false accounts to avoid being caught. Meanwhile, others engaged in a practice called pinning. 
Now, when they set up a new account, the bankers would set the pin to the super easy to remember 0000 so that they could control their client's accounts. Remember Angie, the employee that was so stressed she was drinking hand sanitizer? Well, she gave the New York Times a nice and neat breakdown of the activities of Wells Fargo's bankers. During her time, she and others did some of the following. Open travel accounts for customers that didn't need them by telling them it was unsafe for them to use their normal checking accounts and convince customers to open credit cards to use as overdraft protection, knowing damn well people were already struggling with their money. And they added credit defense onto credit cards. Almost all of this led to more fees for the customers and of course, more money and more sales for the bank. At first, Wells Fargo tried to pass this off as being just a few bad apples. It clearly wasn't a company-wide policy and hey, some people had even gotten fired. At least that's what they wanted people to believe. Meanwhile, the problem was actually incredibly pervasive and the only people who got reprimanded or fired were the ones that made it too obvious. It seemed the only way people actually got in any sort of trouble was if they weren't lying to customers. You know, the whole being transferred to a bank with murder on the menu or the hot walks outside tactics. But maybe, and just maybe, the high ranking executives had no idea that this was going on. Perhaps they were blissfully unaware and just thought they had a kick-ass sales team that somehow opened more accounts than should have been possible. Of course, that's just wishful thinking because they knew exactly what was going on. John Stumpf, the CEO, was even made aware of what was going on by a close friend who told him that the bank had sent him debit cards he never asked for. But did he do anything about it? No, of course he didn't. Eventually, after over a decade of Wells Fargo scamming their customers and virtually torturing their employees, they were caught and it all began to come crashing down. It was 2013 and the Los Angeles Times had just broken the story of the decades long sales scheme that had been running rampant at Wells Fargo. But at the time, no one actually seemed to bat an eye. They explained everything, the pressure on the employees, the punishments, and the complete lack of accountability of the company. Still, the executives adamantly denied that any of this was happening. So it remained relatively quiet for about three more years. That is of course, until the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Office Comptroller of Currency stepped in in September, 2016. After a consulting firm, which was shockingly hired by Wells Fargo themselves, found that they had opened over 1.5 million accounts without their customer's approval, the CFPB decided to step in and hit them with some hefty fines. It was the biggest penalty that the federal regulators had ever placed on a company. And that came in at a whopping $185 million with 5 million going back to the customers that had been swindled. And yeah, you heard me right. Only 5 million went back to the actual people they impacted. But to a lot of people, this penalty didn't seem like enough. I mean, it was a decades long scandal by a multi-billion dollar company. $100 million is just a drop in the bucket for them. But still, the company tried to turn this over and blame it on the employees that they were pushing into near constant anxiety attacks. They were sure to point out that they had fired over 5,000 employees over the years. But if you were the reason the employees felt like they had to lie, cheat, and scam people just to keep their jobs, then that's not quite the flexity flex you think it is. I'm sure they were hoping that this would be the end of everything uncovered and their fines. I mean, they did investigate themselves after all. Shouldn't that show how serious they were? Well, federal regulators also didn't agree with this line of thinking. So the OCC appeared to just fuck up their day and uncovered even more things that they were doing wrong. Soon they found that in addition to creating millions of fake accounts, Wells Fargo was also violating the Service Members Civil Release Act. Basically, they were giving interest rates to service members at a much higher rate than legally allowed, evicting them without informing the court that they were service members and then repossess their cars without getting a court order. So basically just being all types of scummy. And for this, they were fined $20 million. Then the big guns came in because just a few weeks later, the FBI announced that they were opening an investigation on the company. Because once again, companies are awful at investigating themselves and there's just always more to the story. Like, you know, the fact that the CEO and most of the other high ranking officials knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, they left that part out. While the FBI was conducting its investigation, the United States government decided to also get in on the action. Soon, senators left and right were calling for the CEO to step down and claiming that he should be facing criminal charges. But Wells Fargo still felt like they did nothing wrong. They treated their employees just fine. A spokeswoman for the company told ABC News, "'We strive to make every one of them feel valued, rewarded, and recognized, and we pride ourselves on creating a positive environment for our team members.'" And I'm sorry, but what part of working at Wells Fargo was the positive environment exactly? 
Was it the stress that people compared to war? Maybe the unrealistic sales goals, or perhaps the constant blame for the environment the executives created. None of that sounds like a positive environment to me, but all right. But two days before Stumpf was set to testify in front of the House of Representatives, he finally did a relatively good thing. Granted, he probably only did it to save his own ass, but he did a thing. He decided to forego his $41 million of compensation and his bonus. That's so incredibly generous of him. After months of appearances in front of the Senate and the House, turning over their sales practice information to the SEC and multiple federal investigations, the bank was finally hit with a fine that actually addressed the decades of malpractice. In February, 2020, Wells Fargo agreed to pay a $3 billion fine for their 14 years of scamming their customers. 500 million went to the investors who had been fooled by the fake accounts, but there's more because during the investigation, it also came to light that while Wells Fargo had been creating these fake accounts, and of course we can't forget violating service members' rights, they were also forcing people to buy auto insurance that they did not need and charging additional high fees on mortgages and car loans. Also, they were just randomly closing people's checking accounts too. Why? So they could sell them another one, of course. Anything they could do to make it seem like they were service selling machines, they did. So basically they were just scamming people in any way they possibly could. Shockingly, the company finally admitted to what they did and told the Department of Justice that it had put intense pressure on its sales team to meet unrealistic sales goals. Following the announcement, their CEO released a statement which said in part, our customers, shareholders, and employees deserved more from the leadership of this company. Now, as you could imagine, as the scandal finally came to an end, Wells Fargo was floundering. Its profits were down 56%, it spent about $1 billion on refunds for customers, and its hands were tied from participating in aggressive lending practices because of the scandal. As it turns out, scamming your customers for over a decade isn't actually great for business. Now, who would have ever guessed? But while this may be one of the most publicized schemes that have come out of Wells Fargo, it's certainly not the only thing or the only time that they've found themselves in hot water. So what else has the company been up to? Racism, apparently, because that's what they've been up to for decades. Buying a house in the United States has never been the easiest process, and it certainly hasn't been the most accessible, especially for people of color. For centuries, banks and government entities have participated in racial discrimination in a variety of ways. Anything from redlining to predatory lending to just flat out denying home ownership, it's been there. Black home ownership has actually been on a rapid decline. In fact, in 2019, the black home ownership rate was about as low as it was in the 1960s when private race-based discrimination was legal. While we would have hoped that the Fair Housing Act of 1968 would have solved this problem when they outlawed most segregated housing practices, it hasn't done what people thought it would. This is in part thanks to big banks like Wells Fargo for continuing racist and discriminatory lending practices. From 2004 to 2009, Wells Fargo engaged in the practice of charging their black and Latino customers more than white customers for mortgages, regardless of their financial status or qualifications. Basically, a black or Latino person could come in with everything exactly the same as a white person. Same credit score, job, marital status, you know, all the things that make you like the best person for a loan. And instead of doing the right thing, you know, charging people the same rates for the exact background, Wells Fargo decided to charge a higher rate and fee even during the housing boom, but only to non-white folks. As I just mentioned, you can't really do that. There's actually laws in place. You haven't been able to do that since the 1970s. So what gives? Well, they actually claimed it wasn't them. It was mortgage brokers because they can't seem to take accountability for anything. Oscar Suris, a spokesperson said, these loans are being originated under our name. If we can't control the customer experience, we are going to get out of it. But here's the thing, this has been happening for five years. Just like there was no way you didn't know about your employees creating fake accounts, there's no way you didn't know about this either. Put all your loans into a nice little pretty database, which I'm sure you already have. Put together all the information for your customers. Filter by qualification similarities, race and loan amount, and ta-da, you'd see a clear difference. And that's it. That's literally all you had to do to fix it. But no, you had to wait until the government stepped in with a slap on the wrist for you to stop being racist. Do you see the problem here? In the end, the company agreed to a $175 million settlement with the US Justice Department. But of course, they didn't admit to any wrongdoing even though 4,000 cases out of the 34,000 that were investigated showed that their customers were being pushed towards higher fee loans, even when they qualified for cheaper ones. Wells Fargo insisted that they treated everyone fairly and were only agreeing to the settlement solely for the purpose of avoiding contested litigation. 
Sure, Wells Fargo, sure. Still, $50 million off the settlement was sent off to homebuyer assistance programs that were meant to help those recovering from the recent housing crisis. Not surprisingly, they didn't seem to learn much from this incident. In fact, it seems like they actually got worse. In 2020, a man named Maurice Picard III paid over $500 to refinance his home. He thought it would be easy. He was the perfect applicant, an engineer, married to a doctor with an 800 credit score. I mean, if all of that doesn't scream perfect financial risk, then I don't know what does. But as his loan went through the process, he immediately was hit with a few roadblocks. You see, his home was in a predominantly black neighborhood, which his loan officer said was perhaps not eligible for rapid valuation. After a few weeks of back and forths, he was told he would have to pay a higher rate for his refinancing. Then without warning, they just outright denied his application. He's an engineer. His wife is a doctor. He had an 800 credit score. What could possibly stop the company from letting him refinance his house? Well, it turns out he was black and that was apparently enough for Wells Fargo. That's right. Wells Fargo had moved on from offering outrageously high mortgage options to just flat out denying black homeowners refinancing options. According to Bloomberg, they only ever approved about 47% of all applications by black homeowners in 2020. That same year, 72% of white homeowners were approved. Of course, they said they found nothing wrong with the whole situation. They just said that they treat everyone the same and are simply just more selective. Yes, because a roughly 30% difference in just race statistics simply comes from your selectivity. Sure. I'm sure if I pointed out the income rates, that wouldn't prove the racism even further, right? But wait, damn it, it does. Lowest income white applications were approved more than literally all income levels of black applicants except the highest one, which was over 168,000 a year. Meanwhile, when black and white applicants had the same income status, the white families were about twice as likely to have their refinancing approved. And that's not fishy at all, right? That doesn't seem even slightly sus. But of course, they claim they're race blind. They claim that everything was consistent. Just ignore the fact that the data says the exact opposite. Their senior vice president of consumer lending executive communications, Paul Turner, and what an insane job title might I add, said that Bloomberg simply presented the analysis wrong and ignored the banks, quote, strong track record of lending to black homeowners. What strong track record are we talking about here? The five years of predatory lending that was racially biased? Is that the one? Of all the banks in the United States, Wells Fargo was the only one that rejected more black applicants than any amount they accepted. The only one. Their years of racial discrimination have come back to bite them with a class action lawsuit, of course. The lawsuit filed by Aaron Braxton utilized the report to claim that Wells Fargo had been participating in racial discrimination. According to his lawyers, the disparity between Wells Fargo's treatment of black American applicants and non-black American applicants is significant and shocking. Mr. Braxton was given the runaround to such an extent that it took him over nine months to refinance his federally backed mortgage loan. Soon others joined in on the lawsuit, claiming that they too had experienced racial discrimination. Shia Beckwith Simmons, who's 43 years old, fell on hard times during the pandemic, but she leaned on the CARES Act and the 12 month deferment on her mortgage payments to make it through. But when she started paying again, the bank claimed she was in default. Then they told her she could negotiate her rate for more money, of course. If not, she could face foreclosure. She had never missed a payment before the pandemic. She filled out the form for CARES and kept in constant contact with the bank to make sure her forbearance was still working. Still, when it came time to start her payments back up, they told her she'd missed one single form. At a press conference for the lawsuit, Simmons said, "'If I'd died in the pandemic, my husband could have potentially not have known the situation and Wells Fargo would have put my widower and my children out of our home and stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity. The proceedings for the lawsuit are just now underway with the plaintiff seeking $5 million in damages. Wells Fargo, of course, is not off to a great start considering they refused the only black woman judge in the District Court of California. So not the best look for a company being sued for racial discrimination, but hey, I guess it's just in their blood, isn't it? I don't know if they thought that one all the way through. I'm gonna assume they didn't. So for the time being, we're gonna have to just wait and see what happens. Their lending practices aren't the only thing in question here either though. It's also their hiring and treatment of BIPOC employees. In 2008, they faced yet another discrimination lawsuit and this time for their hiring practices. According to the labor department, they discriminated against 34,000 black applicants. In the end, this led to a $7.8 million fine. Through all of this, the bank has continued to argue against the allegations, calling them untrue and claiming that they are the least racist bank ever in the entire world. Ironically, they keep doing this despite them, along with virtually every other big bank in the United States, recently begging their shareholders to vote against the racial equality audit into their company. And that just screams we have nothing to hide and are so awesome, doesn't it? But hey, 
they just can't seem to stop screwing up and have recently found themselves in the news yet again for yet another scandal. And before we hop into this most recent scandal, let's go ahead and take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. Do you have a packed schedule this fall? Well, HelloFresh has meals covered with weekly selections of 30 plus recipes and 70 plus convenience items, all delivered to your door. Because now more than ever, we're looking into ways to save money. In fact, HelloFresh is 25% less expensive than takeout and is even cheaper than grocery shopping too. And fall is the perfect time to cozy up with some delicious sweets. Get the whole family involved with HelloFresh's limited edition kid-friendly baking kits. Now, you know, I absolutely love HelloFresh. I always talk about the firecracker meatballs, but may I introduce you to a new meatball? They have the banh mi meatball, and I had it, I think, two weeks ago on my menu, and it was amazing. A perfect substitute for when firecracker meatball isn't available. So if you wanna get started in the kitchen and get to cooking, make sure you get to hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Online shopping is the way of the future. I don't even know the last time I really go into stores anymore. I absolutely hate it at this point in time. But when you're going to check out, there's always that little field that says, hey, insert a promo code here or a coupon. And sometimes I just don't have one off the top of my head. Well, thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. And that's because Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. And it's super easy to use because you just shop on one of your favorite sites. And when you go to check out, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons. And if it finds one, you'll watch the prices drop. And Honey has saved me money on a whole host of things, including different types of clothes, technology, medical supplies, and of course, pizza, which you guys know I've been using to buy for D&D sessions. And I just tell you, you know, buying pizza and then getting hit with a 20% off coupon thanks to Honey is just absolutely delightful. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop because it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something that I don't use. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. Again, joinhoney.com slash casket. In 2021, the FBI and the Office of the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York joined together to sue the bank for violating the Federal Institutions Reform, Recovery and Enforcement Act, or FERREA. Basically, Wells Fargo decided it would be super fun and quirky to overcharge small or medium-sized businesses who were using their foreign exchange service. Basically, if a small or medium-sized business was participating in any type of international trade, the bank would charge them extra money. In total, they defrauded about 771 total customers. So how did they do this? Well, through a variety of methods as per usual. Instead of just using the transfer rate for the exact day a wire was transferred into a commercial account, the bank would just pick a random date from another day where they could charge more money. Some of the bankers actually just made up random rates that would make the most money and blatantly lied about the profits. And when they were caught, they just said it was a simple mistake, a little accounting error, nothing to see here. When the bank was selling currency, they marked the price up, but for those they bought, they marked it down. All of this led to millions of dollars of extra revenue for the company, and of course, sales incentives for the employees. They were able to get away with it for a while, going after the customers that were least experienced in foreign exchange hence why they went after the small companies. In all, this scam lasted for about seven years. Eventually in September, 2021, the bank was hit with another multi-million dollar settlement, $72.6 million to be exact. And in case you're wondering, the grand total of settlement fines for Wells Fargo in this episode alone is up to about $3.5 billion. So how the fuck is Wells Fargo still alive? And if you're banking with them, why? Once again, the bank blamed the employees for the fraud, firing 20 of them who were involved in the FX business. Meanwhile, the CEO praised the FBI for its investigative work after firing those employees. And I'm just saying, maybe if a company keeps getting in trouble for fraud and shitty behavior, maybe we should stop believing them when they say it's just a couple of bad apples. Clearly, there is a culture of lying, stealing, and cheating to make more money at this bank. And then the whole shtick of blaming it on people that work for them, that act is getting old. Given their track record, I'm sure there's more going on in this bank that we just don't know yet. They always seem to be up to something, scheming and plotting. So I'm almost 100% positive we'll be hearing about them again in the future. But for now, maybe we should do our best to stay the hell away from this bank and hope that at some point, karma catches up with them. 
But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you're subscribing over on YouTube, don't forget to hit that bell notification icon so that you can actually be notified every time there's a new episode. I wanna give a quick shout out as well to all of the patrons over at patreon.com slash Illuminati. I love every single one of you. It's been great hanging out, chatting, VCs, movie nights, you name it. I've been having a great time. You guys are some of the best bunch of people I've ever had the opportunity of being able to chat with and befriend. So thank you for checking out today's episode, hanging out to the end. I really do appreciate it. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 